Well, hello, happy sketch session day. Welcome to the Cure Studios sketch session. I'm really happy you found your way here today. Um, I'm crossing my fingers that I'm live. I had to arrange my windows really weird tonight. So I only see like this little sliver of the window. So, okay, I see movement, so <laughs> that's promising. Um, well, welcome. If you're finding this for the very first time, I'm Carolyn Peters. I'm the owner of Cura Studios, and here we um, practice traditional drawing skills. So you have a super sol solid um, footing to explore your creativity from. And every week we get together and we draw together for an hour, but it's gonna be more tonight. Um, I have a really fun lesson prepared for us and I cannot wait to get into it with you and I hope you're ready for this. It's very different from last week. Last week we did everything tonally. Today we're back to line and to a very joyful, dancing, confident line. And as you might have already seen in the title, we're gonna draw animals, elephants in particular, and our lesson will focus on confidence. And we're doing, or we're getting to the confidence bit by looking at a master draftsman who has come up many times in previous streams before. His name is Heinrich Klei, K-L-E-Y. So if you, if you wanna do yourself a favor, open up a new tab real quick, stay on this one, get, open up a new tab, Google Heinrich Klei, K-L-E-Y. And I will show you one of his images, the only one I could find that's in the public domain and we'll pick it apart. So what we will do is we are going to um, explore what techniques he's using to create his awesome drawings. And once we understand, oh, here's using this and here's using that, then um, we will dive into some imagery of our own and we'll practice that. Now, when we do this, we basically call this a master copy, but we're, we're not going to be copying his drawings. And um, also I don't like the term master copy because it makes you fall into blindly just copying things. You don't think about what it is that the artist was doing. So we're gonna do a master studies at first and then we'll dive into the reference images of real elephants. And we're, we're, tr we're gonna try to draw these real elephants in the manner of Heinrich Klei because his awesome sauce, his wonderfulness is really um, the techniques that he has under his belts sprinkled on top with his trust in his abilities, with his confidence, his faith. And so let's talk about this real brief before we um, jump into the imagery. Um, having confidence in your abilities does not mean that you're gonna get it right and that you're gonna get it perfect every single time. Having faith in your abilities or having trust and having confidence in your abilities means that you have faith that when you go for it, every once in a while you're gonna hit it out of the park. That's true confidence. Knowing full well that most of the times you're gonna fall flat on your nose, but you're gonna be willing to take that risk of falling on your nose because the, the reward, the payoff, the, the, the pot of gold that you can find when you do draw with abandon is really, really big. So I see Chris is here and Ted is here. Awesome, I'm hoping Trish is here too. Thanks for letting me know that I'm live, that's useful. And, um, so glad, Chris, that you looked up his elephant drawings. They're so beautiful, and anytime you need a good chuckle, you just you know look at his drawings, and it's just always going to delight. Okay, so um, did I want to say something before I pick apart the images? No, I don't think so. so. Let me switch the screen. Okay, so me, me, and screen next. I'm going to transition. Okay, so check this out. This is the only image that I was able to find that's in the public domain. So hopefully YouTube will allow us to look at this together. Here's his name. And um, this is a very early um, drawing of his. So what I want to do is uh, I want to pick apart the techniques he's using to make his drawings work, to make his drawings sound. So let's skip to the next slide. Oop, that's not what I meant. Sorry about this, I need to click here. Okay. All right, so the first technique he's using are contours. So contours are the outer edges of something. So um, if you follow that line, I'm looking at the outer edges of her leg, for example. And so 
what makes a contour really good? A contour is good. Um, I don't know. Sorry about this. I'm just noticing that it has the wrong text. There we go. What makes a contour good is that it's very particular um, for, it's, it's, it's look, excuse me, it's, it's looking very closely at the direction changes. So rather than just drawing kind of a noodly line that just kind of wave, wavily runs its course, um, a good contour pays close attention to where does the outer edge change direction. And it's almost like they are pausing at the point where the contour changes direction. So if you look at her knee, notice how there's a very clear um, direction change down the knee and then over and down along the calf, etc. So that's part one for good contours. Another thing, especially if you're doing a master study, you want to look where you're going. It's so um, tempting to keep your eye on the point of your pen, but you kind of need to send your eye further along on your reference where you're going. So that feels scary. That's where you need the confidence for. You need to kind of let go of where your um, pen is touching the paper and you need you to send your eye further along so you know where you're going. And then the, the third thing that will make a contour really nice and successful is line variation. And you'll notice this with him a lot. Some lines are very thick and some lines are very thin. So um, in this image, they're fairly even, but if you look at his later work in particular, he varies his line emphasis drastically from, from thick to thin. Okay, so that's outer contours. That's one technique he's using. Second technique cross contours and planar hatching. So if you have no idea what cross contours are, it's probably better that you pause this and find one of our previous streams where we picked apart cross contours or we picked apart planar um, structure. And um, it's basically this idea that you snap an imaginary rubber band around a form and that you're drawing that rubber band. And like that, you're implying um, the perspective. So notice what I circled those areas. So on the on the belly, you can see how some of these rubber bands are stretching up and then some rubber bands are stretching down, kind of um, explaining that it's almost like a like a globe, you know, with the um, with those circles uh, circling the globe. Um, then on the foot, you can see how he's organizing his shading in the direction of the plane. So a plane is the, the surface um, of anything. So in the surface can point up or it can point to the side or it can point even more to the side. It can point even down. So that's um, the planes. So like on, on my face you have the, the plane of the forehead pointing at you or you have the planes of the temples that are pointing to the sides. So that's the difference between different planes, right? So you see how on the foot he's hatching along with the orientation of this little plane. Um, I don't know if you can see my cursor. I think you can right here. You see that? He's going ch -ch 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 -ch. He's organizing the hatching along the plane on the edge of the foot. Or here he's organizing it at an angle because that plane there is at an angle. Here at the ankle, he's organizing his hatching slightly at a different direction again. So you see he's using planar hatching and then he's not putting this planar hatching everywhere. He's putting that hatching mainly in the um, shadows or in the darker midtone areas because you want to be organized, right? You don't want to put too much everywhere. Okay, next technique, establishing value through shading. So great example is in the background. So how is that different from the planar hatching, you might ask? Well, with the value shading, you're not so much interested in building form. You're interested in building degrees of lightness and darkness. And you, so you keep your shading one directional. So one directional shading. And the effect of that is that it will flatten out the area that you put that one directional shading on. And you can space your shading closer together, your hatch marks, or you can space them further apart. You can even cross hatch it. Um, and like that, you can darken your values. And then the last technique 
the last thing that he's looking at is texture. And now this is where he allows himself to play especially much. So texture would be the surface texture stuff. It's something furry, is something um, wiry, is something slick. So um, there he lets his hand kind of go. He, he, lets, he gives his hand a, a loose lead, so to speak. Um, and you can see it on the, the back of the foot, the little hair indications, that's pretty controlled. But then look at that shadow that he puts behind there. So he's almost like implying that it's like a dirt surface that he's on and um, the fabric on top that he's grasping onto, that is um, where he really just kind of lets it squiggle and implies very um, generously um, what, what, what this thing is like. Okay, so now that we understand these techniques that he's drawing on, um, let's come back briefly to the idea that he is so good because he understands technique so well. He has practiced, he's masterful at technique. So he has confidence because he understands technique. And then the other thing is he's playful with it. He, he knows that because he's practiced his, his classical training so much, he won't fall if he lets go a little bit. So um, with those things together, every line has a purpose. The line describes an outer edge. The line describes a plane. The line establishes value. The line establishes texture. See, every line has a purpose. And um, he trusts his hands. And the other thing, he has studied anatomy a ton. So he can draw animals and people out of his imagination. He's aware of all the particularities. And that's another thing that makes um, his stuff so incredible. So if you want to get to this level, you just study your, your fundamentals. And what I would do, because I'm, I'm addressing this question because I, I made this stream because somebody asked me, hey, can you tell me how to draw like Heinrich Klei? And so if this is your goal, I want you to pick your favorite animal or your favorite person and obsessively study them. Study their skeletal structure, study their uh, muscles, look what their body shapes look like in different action poses and draw it from all different directions. So you're so familiar with at least one animal or one person or one thing. And of course, studying that only works if you have your foundations in place, if you understand what plane changes are and all that. But once you have that, and then you lean into, and what do I like? Then you're gonna get someplace. Okay, so I'm gonna have much more to share as we draw, but I think it's time that we jump into the drawing. So let me close this window here. Here are our elephants. Let me transition over to my drawing pad. All right, here we go. So um, we're starting with one minute gestures, just to get warmed up. I'll be working with a dipping pen, just because I believe either Kai um, worked with a dipping pen or with a fountain pen. So that's what I'll be using, but you can use whatever. So let me hit play. And here we go. Let's just get situated here. So we use these first um, drawings just to get warmed up. So right now I'm really just getting used to having a quill in my hand, making some marks, and they're probably going to be horrible drawings. Let me scoot this over. 
slightly different here. Let me So you choose your focus. Now that we're looking at the reference, are you choosing to eventually focus on anatomy? Are you choosing to focus on how can I use cross contours? Are you choosing to focus on maybe um, picking an expression and playing with that? So when you um, draw in this manner, what we began with is looking at contours, right? That was our starting point. And to make contours, contour drawing successful, we have to, and I said this before, we have to give our lines a measure of trust and a little bit of a long lead. So what I mean by that is we can't chicken scratch. We can't kind of constantly backtrack with our marks, um, kind of constantly second guessing, is this gonna be the right one? Is this gonna be the right one? We kind of just have to lean in and, and trust that hopefully the direction that I'm sending this line into will be good enough. And maybe it'll hit it just so. But if we're timid and we're kind of scratching away, that's always gonna read worse than a line drawn with chutzpah. And even though that line technically might not be in the right spot or even exactly right where it should be, but like a mistake done confidently trumps a perfectly line, drawn line that's all timid and second guessing. So here I'm shading in one direction just to drop certain areas into a darker value. Here I'm doing some cross contouring. I got this little fella in before. It's too late. So if you're on my email list and you read this week's email, you um, heard me or you read me <laughs> talk about this analogy of making a confident line. It's like when you're surfing, you need to jump on your feet. Like if you catch a wave when you're surfing, you need to jump on your feet. Otherwise you're gonna, you know, somersault. <laughs> And it's scary, it feels like you're, you know, first of all, it takes a lot of effort, but also feels sometimes not safe. It sometimes feels safer to get on your knees instead, but that, that's, that's not really the case. So Chris, you're a surfer if you're still here. You probably know all about that. <laughs>
So the longer you can make your marks, not for the sake of let's make the longest mark ever, but the longer you can make them, the better, especially the longer you can make them without second guessing yourself. And as I said, um, you're totally risking horrible drawings like this. And then as you're seeing, like, you know, I'm already making plenty of horrible drawings. But um, I, I know that if I keep going, I'll probably hit a groove eventually. Maybe not, but it's very likely that I will hit a groove. And then I'll maybe create one that's really something. So when whenever we do master studies or animal studies with a particular focus, we don't do that, or we shouldn't do it with the expectation of making a masterpiece, but we're completely open and grateful when something good happens. It's a little subtlety. <laughs> Chris, I like it. He who hesitates or she who hesitates is lost. Absolutely. It's so true. The same goes for drawing. It's no different. So it comes, so with, with surfing and with drawing, it, it comes down, do you have the capacity to suffer your, your own wipeouts? You know, can you laugh about them? Can you, can you just, you know, ignore them? And with your drawings, can you suffer your bad drawings? Can you get, can you get over yourself, you know? Okay, so I'm gonna try a slightly different strategy. Like I'm gonna try it and loosely sketch things in first. And then I'm gonna go for my contours. <laughs> Isn't this little guy just the cutest? And now, of course, you know, if we want to come back to Ply, um, he doesn't just um, draw the animals um, just the way that he sees him, them in the zoo or the way he might have seen them on a safari. I don't know if he ever went on a safari or not, but um, he anthropomorphizes them. He tells stories with them. So that is a whole nother skill then. Like, and you'll see, like, especially with this one already, but later on there will be another one where you start to see their character and you can start to see um, certain contours that make up their facial expressions. And so studying those things as you're doing your animal studies. So doing studies with a really clear focus will get you closer. Because what you're doing, when we do studies, when we do studies, we fill our inner library, our image library. And the more we, um, and not just studying with looking, like studying with our eyes only, that's kind of worthless. It's studying with our hands. There, I don't know if it's body memory, muscle memory, I don't know what it is, but it, it does get captured. And we can then draw from that library. And I don't know if it's any consolation for any of you who might be thinking, oh, I could never draw anything from imagination. I always need a reference picture. Um, so did I. Like, I was in that same boat always, even through my art school days. I always needed a reference photo to work from until I studied anatomy. And once I studied anatomy, I realized I could make stuff up because now I finally understand the mechanics of the body. And then you couple studying anatomy with studying form. True draftsmanship, like how to make something look three-dimensional on the page. 
And all of a sudden, I was now able to draw things from imagination, whereas before, it was like such a crutch, you know, such a, not crutch, it was such a Achilles heel. It's a good question to ask yourself when you're making a, a line. What does this line belong to? What form does this line belong to? So right now I just drew the edge of this haunch and then I asked myself, what, what's the other part of this form? Well, this inside here. So I'm trying to make it look like they could belong together. Because it's so easy to end up with these linear drawings where it's just like a bunch of noodles. <laughs> hey, David. I'm glad that that Lance says hi. <laughs> Learned so much from Lance. I'm glad you're drawing with us tonight too. So again, every time you're making a mark, ask yourself, what is this line for? <laughs> Here's another absolutely beautiful specimen. Let me see if I have some room over here. Okay, so I like my technique of beginning loose, my usual way. It's weird, you know, like when you do uh, these public things and then especially there's like, oh, the pressure is on having to draw just like clay. And then all of a sudden you try and adopt something that isn't yours. And actually that's something I wanted to talk about anyways. Um, then you, you know, freeze up and a bunch of crap comes out. <laughs> nothing, nothing works. And um, you gotta do it your own way, you know? And, and I think that's where the main benefit of studies, of master studies lies. It's like you understand how they did something so amazing but then you don't just like end at wanting to look just like them. You, you make it yours then. And the way you make it yours is by trusting your hand and by following your delights. Like what do you want to draw? Like maybe it's not dancing elephants for you. Maybe it's, you know, I don't know, cars that drive fast or palm trees swaying in the wind. So I'm never a big fan of um, you know, picking a teacher because he does this thing like a shtick and then you just want him or her to teach you that shtick and you know, then what next? Like, what do you do next? So I'm beginning all, all that to say that I'm doing my own method, you know, I, I start loose and general and um, then now I'm getting a little bit more technical about, okay, now I'm just applying a contour and then maybe I'm doing a cross contour, maybe some shading, etc. Yeah, he did. So James and I, um, we we're pals, and um, we were in the same classes. So for people who can't see the chat, uh, they're talking about a former teacher of mine um, from whom I learned a lot. And so as, as you guys are drawing, I hope you're all drawing along. Um, if questions come up, maybe you checked out more of his drawings and you have questions, feel free to pop anything in the chat. Um, or you can always um, put anything in the comments after the live is done. So the other thing that Clyde does is he creates shorthands. 
So, you know, for the texture of the wrinkly trunk, he's not going to draw every single wrinkle. He kind of makes himself a shorthand and then uses that Oops. rather than drawing every single wrinkle. Every single of these wrinkles has light logic on it. They roll into shadow. And then anything that is in shadow, I just apply a straight one directional hatching over it. And see, it's in that when, whenever you let loose, whenever ever you risk, I think that's when the magic comes into your drawing. So I think I've said this already a lot, but you know, that that is truly like you, you don't need to go seeking for a magic trick. Uh, and I know I just said, said the word ma magic, but I don't mean like, you know, there's no secret. The secret, which isn't a secret is you, you, you practice your fundamentals, perspective, how do I make a cylinder look three-dimensional on the paper? How to make a box look three-dimensional on a paper? How to make an egg look three-dimensional on the paper? You practice making good contours. And then you mush it all together and you let go a little bit. Let me get to a new page here. That one wasn't all bad. <laughs> I'm flinging ink all over the place. Okay, so we have two, we have seven minutes to get these two onto the page. Let's just, let's go for it. So we have big belly here. And so Disney was influenced by Clive's animal drawings. And um, I think, who was it? Was it Ted? You, you said something that Proko had the um, walkthrough of one of his sketchbooks, What a Lucky Guy. Um, and I think Marshall might have been there. Um, looking through the sketchbook to Marshall as a friend. And so Marshall and I, we, we share um, this love for Klai. And, um, you know, I came across him in, in Germany and um, Marshall has kind of like had this long passion for him too. So I'm talking about Marshall Vandruff. A lot of you might know him from the Draftsman um, podcast. And so this is always something we would just, you know, love to chat about. over here. So if there are any artists who you just absolutely love, preferably dead artists um, from more than 100 years ago, um, I can always do a breakdown of what they do and how they do it. And um, um, this is something I think fun and worthwhile. So please, Let me know if you have suggestions. And I say dead and preferably from a hundred years ago because then their images are in the public domain and I don't have to worry about uh, not showing images on the stream and getting into trouble with that. Um, if you are 
newer here, one of the things I always encourage people to do, like draw along as, as I draw, um, but then come back after you went through the stream to your favorite image, pause it, and then do the favorite image for however long you want to have with it. Um, and I mean, I guess you could do it during the stream too, just kind of hit pause and give yourself extra time. But I think that's really, like this image would be definitely something that, you know, I'd want to come back to because seven minutes is so short and I feel like this would be a gold mine to get some expressiveness, you know, kind of teasing out more of that. So if anybody wants to do that and t um, share the fruits of their labors, tag me on Instagram, I want to see. Oh yeah, no, the, the, the Gibson guy, the, the, the guy who drew the Gibson girls, that would be fun, right? Is that who you're thinking about? This here is quickly falling apart, that's okay. Let's see if I can pull it out of the muck. Again, one of the things, one of the main lessons about today, no backtracking when you make your lines. Force yourself in the friendliest, most joyful way to keep moving forward, not to backtrack, not to look back. Just pull that line and again, it might just suck really, really hard, <laughs> but it also might just redeem itself or you might redeem yourself through it. You never know. You never know until you do it. You know, we're not dealing with crazy, dangerous experiments. It's just paper. I have some things off here, but the length of the trunk, let's bring that over here. So if I make a mistake when I'm drawing in ink, I'll just redraw it, especially in these kind of gestural, fast, drawings, no time to erase or fret. So one thing that Clay also does is he does a lot of repetition. So especially if you like see how under the, the jawline here, um, if you want to get that darker, like if you just repeat some of your contours um, briskly, um, that's something he does. Ink on Sheila, that would be fun. Um, I like the idea of mixing watercolor into it. Uh, I'm not, you know, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, making drawings more expressive is not natural to me, but you know, it definitely, it's good to practice. So I, I'd be into it, but I'd probably particularly enjoy um, playing with watercolor and, and ink. So if we do Egon Schiele as somebody to pick apart, then I'd be into it. I, I sure love his work. Okay, so here we have seven minutes. Um, we can do some expression studies. If I can get my board to just stay up here. So 
Now, of course, we, we do have to acknowledge that drawing like this is not the end all be all. It's just one way of drawing, but just some people absolutely love it and other people, they don't really care so much for contour drawings and they much rather have a tightly controlled value drawing. And you know, it's so great that we have so many different ways of creating drawings and, and that you get to explore what it is that tickles you. Um, so it's good to try something on, see if it fits. And if it just, you know, doesn't make you happy, um, see what you learn from it and then move on. I'm doing some um, planar hatching. I'm trying to imagine what's the orientation of these planes by the forehead. It's quite tricky to not get lost in all of this. So many wrinkles and folds. So a question that I'll ask myself, and I think I might have shared it already, is what does this line belong to? Does it belong to the edge of a form or does it belong to a wrinkle like is it texture and whenever you draw a segment of a line always think about where does it end like where does it go to and you don't need to close off the whole shape but um, you need to let your pen or pencil think in that direction So you'll notice anytime I throw in a one directional value, like a, just a way to imply that this is uh, in the shadows, let's say, it unifies your drawing. Let's see if I can get this goofball down here in before the time runs out. One thing I usually say in the beginning of these sessions, if you're newer and um, you're still drawing along, um, I, I want you to think about these sessions as a mixture of um, exercising to get stronger, you know, just how you go to the gym to work out, grow some stamina, um, as well as being a playground. So, and, and you wanna pick, do you need a strong workout tonight? or whenever you're drawing, or do you need to um, just play and let loose? And I designed these sessions, the reason why I only have a few minutes per pose, why we don't get to spend like 20, 30 minutes on these elephants, which would be much more satisfying, right? Um, is because I want you to think quickly. I want you to make decisions quickly. And the more you do that, the quicker you'll learn. Yes, you, you'll create a lot more awful drawings, but you'll grow more. And so I know it's not a popular thing. So if you're here, you, you belong to the few who like to work and like to grow. And I totally salute you for it. But I get it. It's often frustrating. But you know, we can do hard things and the reward is so big. Oh, he's in the water. Okay. Let's 
this crazy hair here. Yeah, you probably would not be thrilled but you know that's this thing like as I said people sort of different like Lancey loves long 60 hour poses and resolving every single square inch of the painting and that would drive me nuts and but it delights him so you know I'm just gonna find what's right for you I think we have two more I think this one and then one more So if you're wondering like, okay, what should I do? Should I first um, do outer contours and then cross contours? But I see you mixing it all up. Um, I, in the beginning, like especially if you are not very confident in your contour ability or in your cross contour ability, I would probably just do one at a time. You know, like let's do all our outer contours first and then let's find some areas that would be good for some cross contours. I would probably make my way like that through the drawing. But once you kind of get it, you know, once you understand, oh, okay, I need this kind of mark for my cross contours, I need that kind of mark for just values, I need this kind of mark for my outer contours, then you can just kind of do it all simultaneously. Like, this is the ideas of juggling multiple balls all at once you know if, if i was learning how to juggle which i still have not learned <laughs> i talk about juggling a lot when i teach um i wouldn't begin with 10 balls i'm assuming i'd probably begin with one or two so another thing if you want to take this to the next level is um, pick your favorite reference from tonight and see if you can anthropomorphize it. Just see what happens. Like, how would you go about doing that? Maybe you can put some clothes on them. Maybe you can make them hold something or her. Again, I want to see I want to see those attempts, and and you know I totally know that these often are probably the most embarrassing things. Um, so if you don't want to post it on on your Instagram feed, uh, I get that, but you can always DM me. Like if you're on Instagram at Cura Studios, just send me a DM with a photo of of your explorations. You know, just just so I can say awesome. I'm so glad you kept working on this. I'm so cl glad you you dove really deep with this. Um, one thing I have not talked about yet is that if you want your drawings to look like another artist's drawings, at least so you can understand what they're doing, you want to use the tools that they were using. 
So that's why I switched tonight into using just a steel nib. Uh, at first I was going to try a fountain pen, but that was not the right tool because it was too thick of a nib and it was just not um, having the variability that this Nico nib has. Yes, he does. He does have those ice skating. I actually just drew them this morning just to kind of, you know, familiarize myself with what he does. And they're just, gosh, there's this one guy who, who um, falls and it's just like his tumble. And then next to him is the other guy just kind of nonchalantly swishing past him. So good. So, so good. So you see up here, that's where we have um, a major plane change. How do I know this? Because this here is catching light and then all of a sudden it's in shadow. So it, this surface is oriented differently than the side of his body there. And so anytime we have a plane change, that's where you want to put some cross contour segments. Not the whole thing, uh, but just some segments and they will send us across the form. And then that's often where Cly did this. He squiggled rather than going <coughs> He just would, you know, make a squiggle, but it's still intended to go across the form. And then for the value of the shadow, you just go one directional. So that's a little, I mean, you know, all the good artists do this. Michelangelo does this, Raphael does this. You, you, you create your core shadow with cross contour uh, marks. And whether you do that in charcoal or in ink, it doesn't matter. And how you do that cross, um, excuse me, that, that core shadow, that, you know, there's some of your style. Like if you think about Steve Houston, amazing figure drawing artist, you know, he has his thing where he does also like a zigzaggy kind of a um, core shadow. And if you're still a beginner and you're like, oh, I don't even know what a core shadow is, what are they talking about? Um, don't worry about it. Make that your goal to understand what the core shadow is. And I can help you out if you watch a previous video on light logic. Just kind of keep scrolling through the old lives. I explain it, I think, in one of those, I think. Okay. Do I have room? Yes, I have room over here. Look at this little guy. Like, I could see him becoming anthropomorphized as, like, like you'd have to have to lower his ears a little bit more like shy, you know, somebody standing in front of him, holding something out to him and he's shy or feels bad for doing something. You know, like just let your imagination, like, okay, what would make him look this way? Like, what does it make me think about? Like here, you could see. I, I have never, I never studied animation, which is where you would learn more about like facial expressions and how to draw them. You know, it's just something I would need to study more. Like actually, to sit down and draw facial expressions consciously. But like I would probably pop in an eye that's a little bit more downcast. So like I would look at some reference of somebody kind of doing that and then I'd see if I could pop their eye into here.
when you have a long line like the trunk that's where that's a perfect opportunity to kind of send your eye ahead of where you're going like the same when you're throwing a ball and you need that ball to hit a certain spot you're not going to look at the ball you're going to look where you want the ball to go not like I know much about that, but you know, it's a good analogy. Ball throwing has always been one of those elusive skills in my life. And so here, those folds on the skin, that's something. And see that pole behind that upper arm bone? Something to include. So coming back to the idea of, okay, what would we do um, if we wanted to take this to that kind of anthropomorphized level? To be honest, if I really would want to make that happen, I probably wouldn't start in pen and ink at that time. I would first play around in graphite or with a Prismacolor pencil um, until I have the expression and the pose so I can understand what it needs to look like. And so I can use those references. And then once I've done it, I'd probably throw it out and then see if I could pull it off without it, just with the pen and ink. Like if I wanna do a true Cly um, character drawing. Because I'm not at the level where I can just make up, you know, uh, expressive character. People I can do, but I can't do all animals. And so I'm, I'm saying that so you feel that you have license to do that too. You know, it's like, so I think it's so easy that we notice oh man this is really hard i can't do that and then we don't allow ourselves to do baby steps you know it's like either it has to come up perfectly through this uh, idea that i had to this pen and ink technique that i had in mind or nothing <laughs> and uh, i don't like the all, all or nothing it's like i'd rather take you know some embarrassing baby steps first practice that and then when i feel like oh now i get it then i throw the train wheels off and go for it so I'm all four train wheels. This is not half horrible. Okay. And then we could do the same here as the shadow. I didn't get the length quite right. Also, sometimes when you have to hustle and kind of uh, make corrections before the time runs out, uh, you, you make your marks more forceful all, all of a sudden, and you kind of throw caution to the wind, and that's usually when something good happens. It's also sometimes, or it's also usually when something bad happens. <laughs> but we talked about this before, right? The price of admission. cool thing with with the steel nib so all of you who were in my 
daily sketchbook um, class, you know that the cool thing about steel knit is um, that it's irregular, right? Sometimes it splatters and does something unexpected and that's something cool. All right, last image of the evening. And I put that one as just because, you know, that's the closest as we'll get to a laughing elephant. situated right here I'm trying to get the big swoop of this pose first. It goes from the back over the head. So again, like the more you can find a unification for the different body parts, the less you're likely to end up with a drawing where you just have a bunch of um, separate lines that don't feel like they belong together. Since I have a little bit longer for this one, I'm going to try and slow my mark down. Just be a bit more deliberate with my, with my mark rather than rushing. Okay, so there's a difference between making a fast mark and making a mark with chutzpah. Um, sometimes they're fast, but they don't have to be fast. Um, another thing that just came to mind, um, when, when you're doing a contour-based drawing, and you're kind of focusing on all the direction turns, or turns of directions of the contour, it's, that's often the easiest way to um, blow your proportions. And, and it's not the end of the world, you know, um, but if you wanna avoid that, the best tip for you is that you want to keep zooming out and looking relationally all the time. Like if I'm drawing this edge of the trunk here, I'm zooming out on the reference and looking at the shape in between or looking at how far is this tip in comparison to the other um, tusk here. So always finding another nearby place to relate your current mark to. Adding a lot of this texture here. So I'm definitely juggling everything at once here. Maybe um, at the end of these, I'll go over some of the lines and what they're for and what they're doing. careful with that shape under the eye. Again, the more careful I am with those um, feature shapes, like eyes and mouth and stuff, the more 
I'll be able to capture that beautiful laugh that <laughs> this elephant has. Just so joyful. So for me, I was definitely, uh, as a young, young person, as a kid, I was always um, wavering between, oh, do I want to become somebody who trains horses or do I want to become a biologist studying animals or do I want to do something creative? Like, do I want to draw, essentially? Um, so you want to ask yourself, what, what passions, what delights have you had in your life? Um, and, and use those as breadcrumbs to lead you to um, you know your, your ice skating elephants. So, you know, not everybody loves drawing animals. Um, maybe, as I said earlier, maybe you're just like totally into cars and that's your thing, but you also love drawing. So, you know, put those two together. You don't have to, but it might bring up something fun. So here with these big ears, that's where I'm kind of sending my eye ahead. Again, kind of staying zoomed out so I know where I'm going. See how the trunk, the end of the trunk, it's all shadow. I'm just gonna go one dimensional or one directional, one directional here. <laughs> oh, you're so welcome. I wasn't sure if you're gonna be here. So is, is, do you say your, your name's Sorab? Um, of course, I'm probably saying that completely wrong, but I'm so glad that you're finding some value in this. So all of these lines I've been working on right here, kind of cross contour lines. Same thing on the right side of the spine. I'm just gonna do one directional.
here we have a bit of a plane change on the ear. You see how it goes from facing this way to facing this way, and then it flips back out. Um, Remember in the beginning I said those cross contours and you put them in the shadow or like at the edge of the shadow and the mid-tone. So you don't put them in the light necessarily. Mid-tone are those kind of darker lights. So I'm trying out some squiggly lines here to see if that will do anything for the texture. I'm not quite sure. But you know, that's something that Clyde would do. <laughs> that's, I, I said that in the beginning, like he lets his lines loose to indicate that texture. Alrighty, well, that was it. We had a long session today, like I had an hour's worth of images, but um, this is where we ended up. So um, I'm going to leave this picture up real quickly. I want to talk through some of the edges, but uh, rather than me talking to the camera. So here, this would be a good outer contour. I find it good because it's very clear about how it changes direction down over, down, it changes thickness and thinness. It's, um, it looks where it's going so that those, it has all the qualities and it's not doing this. It's not chicken scratching. Um, so th that would be an outer contour area. Let's find some cross contours. So here are definitely some cross contours. Imagining that there are these cross sections of the trunk that um, where I'm just kind of hitting the parts where the shadow edge was. Um, here's a uh, cross contour. You can also call this planar hatching. Here I'm organizing my lines with the plane change, oh, excuse me, with a plane that's kind of by the eye socket here. So those would be the cross, con uh, cross contours and planar hatching marks to indicate the structure, the three-dimensionality. Then we have um, texture lines right here um, that kind of are loose in that. Uh, oh, and value. So value shading, let me find a good spot. Oh yeah, so the tip of the trunk, see those all in shadow. So here I just went one directional to imply that this is in shadow. So those are our four techniques. And of course, let me switch over to, hold on, where's my mouse here? Over here. Uh, and of course, we want to use all of these techniques with faith in our ability that sometimes we'll hit it right. Knowing full well that a lot of the times will fall on our face and that's just fine. So I hope you got something out of tonight. Um, as I said, tag me on any of your posts on Instagram. And if you like this and you're ready for more, get on my email list. I put the links in the description below. You'll even get a free pen and ink um, materials guide when you sign up and you won't miss any of the offers that I have coming down the pipes in the future. Next week we'll do pillows expressive pillows. Uh, we'll talk. I don't know yet what exactly we'll focus on, but I think it's going to be super fun. So I hope I'll catch you then and I'll see you soon. Oh, I'm so, sorry. Before I head out, I'm so glad that Trisha loves the laughing elephant. Me too. <laughs> Alrighty. Have a good one, you guys.